I have a bunch of NBA stuff that I want to get to, and I'm actually so pissed off about this Garrett Cole story, not because of what he did, but again, the reaction to it, that if I start there, I'm going to get completely derailed and not get to anything. So the Suns blow out the Nuggets last night. This is not entirely surprising. Uh, Portland didn't beat good teams. Portland couldn't really defend better teams. And, you know, that series still could have gone Portland's way. And I think there are certain examples where it's glaring the difference between regular season and postseason for some of these teams. And looking at Phoenix, um, they're terrific. I mean, they're they're so locked in. And the only way I wasn't picking them to win the West was because of the Lakers. And I like Phoenix against Utah. You know, we'll get to the Clippers and, and Jazz for a little bit here. I don't know how much I'm going to do on all four series. But there's this locked-in thing with Phoenix uh, that is very real. And it's incredible because Booker hasn't really had to go off. Paul's closed these fourth quarters. Oh, they didn't need him in the fourth quarter last night. But what he did in the third quarter last night, what he did in the fourth quarter in game one, defensively, they've been terrific. Um, the Aiton story has been a major success. And I'm telling you, midway through the season, if you were watching them all season, there was moments where, you know, it looked like, I didn't even know if Monty trusted them all the time. I'm pretty sure Chris Paul didn't. And look, you guys can say whatever you want about um, my opinion of Aiton, um, because this happens a lot with players. It's like, okay, this is how I feel about a certain guy. And then the player gets better and it's like, see, and you're like, yeah, but that's not what he was doing. I was listening to Eddie Johnson, who is with the team all the time. And he was talking about like Aiton doing just a better job and working with the coaching staff. And he is great against Denver. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this stuff that's out there, but it's kind of like something that we're learning about again is that Jokic through the regular season was really complimentary in a way that, you know, sometimes you're not expecting an MVP type of guy. We'll get to Jokic winning the MVP here. Um, but Jokic said this after a regular season game. This is back in, I think, January. It was that overtime game. He said, quote, he's amazing. He's amazing. Uh, give the guy credit. He's really solid. He knows like what he needs. I think that's the best thing a young player can have. And the mindset, he plays really good defense. He stopped me five, six, seven, eight times. Give that guy credit. He was really good tonight. So if you look at Aiton's numbers in the regular season, the best team he, he scored against was Denver. He averaged 22 and 12 on 70% shooting. Yeah, two-game deal. But you can see there's something about him that makes Jokic work a little bit more. And let's face it, for all the love, and I don't think there's any of us watching Jokic going, although, you know what, if they get blasted out of this series, I kind of can't wait for the retroactive, like, yeah, he wasn't really the MVP, which, you know, people can't. It's like the Heisman deal. They'd be like, you know, all those other games that we watched all year long that counted, especially a guy like Jokic who didn't miss any, and all the other guys, like, missed a lot of games, and he was awesome. Yeah, that's that's what we vote on, actually. We don't. We don't vote on, like, was your team hurt and not as good as the other team in the playoffs? That's not what we should be doing. But Aiton's numbers, those are the best numbers he had against any real team. And I say real team because against Houston, he went for 24-12 on 71% shooting in three games. But Houston was a fake team this year, and I think Rockets fans would even admit that. So the Aiton thing is is unbelievable. The defensive rotations that they have, and, you know, they've tried to – Anyone will tell you, like, you've got to figure out a way to play Jokic, uh, Jokic straight up. He needs to do a better job. We all need to do a better job. But his nickname's a hard J and his real name's a soft J. And it, I catch myself constantly with it. So I apologize. I, I'm trying. I'm trying. And you know what? Take it easy on yourself, too, for those of you out there that screw that one up. But it's just tough when you have a guy whose last name is a completely different pronunciation from his nickname. Although Big Honey, if we could just all get on board with Big Honey... I'm fine with that too, but apparently he doesn't really like that. So, Aiton, terrific. And Bridges, that's the other part of this team where I just love that there's moments where Bridges can kind of carry him a bit offensively. His body control in transition, and I'm telling you, there are times when I've watched Bridges, and he had a miss last night, but I still was impressed with the miss because I couldn't believe where he started the attempt from in transition. He was trying to get a layup. There's layups where I think, ah, he's not going to get there, and he gets there. There's threes where I think his setup for a shot takes a little too long, and he just, it doesn't matter. Like, he'll let you contest into him, and he still gets the shot off. And so you haven't even needed some crazy game from Booker. Um, I'll also throw this out there because I just have to mention my guy. I've been keeping track of the Lou Dort Awards, and Lou Dort at one point in the playoffs, and this is nothing against Lou Dort. I like Lou Dort. And he shot it better this year, too. So, you know, Oklahoma City's got something in Lou Dort. But Lou Dort, 
there was a graphic because of all the threes he was taking in that Houston first round series, because that was basically what Houston was doing, was like, let Lou Dork go crazy. Where I think it was like this many threes attempted this many points on on this percentage shooting. So they're all positives. And I think the graphic was Jordan, Kobe, and Lou Dort. And you go, all right, something seems a little off on that one. Because DeAndre Ayton has one right now that you wouldn't expect. Here, after this is after game one, so now it doesn't count. But DeAndre Ayton, this is, this is what we had him qualifying for. 20 points, 10 rebounds, shooting, right? So Aiton had four games in which he recorded 20 and 10 on 65% shooting in the playoffs. The older, the only other NBA player in playoff history to record uh, four such games in a seven-game span, so six against the Lakers, game one against Denver, is Kareem in 1974. I've just praised Aiton for about two minutes here. That seems a little Lou Dordish. So I'd like to keep track of the Lou Dort awards. Anything that jumps out at you where you're like, wait, what? I mean, Donovan Mitchell is not Lou Dort, but Donovan Mitchell already has surpassed um, Carl Malone in 40-point games. So that was like, wait, what's going on? But Chris Paul now is the first player with 15 points, 15 assists, zero turnovers in a playoff game since Chris Paul in 2014. And that was the first time a player had done it since Chris Paul in 2008. So... um. It's getting a little misty over here. I'm just saying. All right, so that's where we're at with this series. And Denver, by the way, throughout most of this run, they've never really been able to defend. And by the way, another thing, as I keep adding on, the Michael Porter Jr. back injury, he's running around in a heating pad the whole time before the game, and then he shoots like it. And their final three-point shooting numbers weren't terrible, but they were to start the game. I mean, they were, they were what do I have here, 2-18 to start. Because they ended with some decent numbers, but that's not really what was going on with them. They couldn't shoot it if Porter can't get it going. I would love to know because apparently Aaron Gordon and Jamichael Green ripped into the team after game one. What's an Aaron Gordon pep talk like? Like you guys, you guys don't know what winning's about. Like how does Aaron Gordon, who's been there a few months, who, you know, is a nice player. Everybody would like Aaron Gordon, but he doesn't change the course of who you are as a franchise. I mean, Denver needed him and he had some moments against Portland. Um, but offensively, I think Nuggets fans are probably like, wait, is this it? Is this it offensively? Be honest, Nuggets fans. Like that's happened to you. You're like, huh? So this guy's like, everybody wanted to trade for him. How does he re- like, Hey man, when we beat Portland or when we beat Toronto in game one and no one believed in us and DJ Augustine was like, be ready. You know, we set a tone for that series. We lost the next four, but you know, it's, uh, I just can't imagine Aaron Gordon ripping into a Nuggets team where most of those guys were in the conference finals last year, and it's Aaron Gordon. Again, no offense. Real quick on the Sixers. They figured out a couple things, uh, certainly in the second matchup, and the piece that Kevin O'Connor, the ringer, you should check him out. Uh, We've had him on the pod a bunch of times. He had a good thing from Second Spectrum where they looked at the defensive alignment because Danny Green was responsible for getting torched for the majority of Trey Young's points, especially in the first half. And you could see clearly in Game 2 the adjustment. Game 1, Danny Green, 49 plays. Thibel, 14 plays. Simmons, 8 plays defensively. The only reason Simmons didn't have more defensive plays against Trey Young is because of those two foul calls to start the second half. Uh, game two, Simmons, 31 plays. Thibel, 29 plays. Green, two plays. So there we go. Uh, I'm really, really impressed with Atlanta, though. So I'm not ready to completely write this series off. I do think Philadelphia is the better team. Hunter's going to be out now, but you know he wasn't really part of the mix with the limit on his minutes to begin with. But I can't wait to see what happens in game three. Like That's just how impressed I am with Atlanta. But I was, I was actually like surprised because defensive... Stuff. I think coaches will go in and they can be really stubborn. It's very easy for us to be at home. And that's why we really, you know, hammer on substitutions or if a guy has too many fouls, like Aiton had two fouls right away last night. And you're like, oh, what's going to happen here? Monty Williams leaves him in. Guess what happens? If you get in a third foul, everybody who does what I do would be like, oh, because an idiot. Because it's easy for us to identify those mistakes or something that results in a mistake and hurts your chances to win. So then we just hammer on everybody all the time. Same as timeouts, same as substitutions and all that kind of different stuff. But when it's really glaring and it's a defensive matchup like Danny Green trying to contain Trey Young, you're like, why are why are you doing this? And I really thought, you know, they're going to try to change it in that second half. And I thought those two calls um, with Trey Young sticking out his arm like that 
as great as he is and everything else, you know, look, we've been over this. Um, that that changes what you can kind of do there defensively. So it also makes me wonder what's going to happen in game two for the Clippers and the Jazz because they went Luke Kennard hunting there late. And Donovan Mitchell, uh, with his ridiculous outburst, and let's not forget, I mean, we're a year removed from he and Jamal Murray having one of the all-time great offensive showdowns, and that's without Conley. That game was ugly early. Jazz get out to a 10-2 run. They missed 21 straight shots, and the Clippers still lose that game. And they're losing it because Paul George. Like, Mitchell's a guy that gives you a chance. Like, if you don't have one of those, you know, Mitchell, this is a great question, and I'm going to ask Rudy this after the break, but, like, who would you rather have, Westbrook or Paul George? Because there's a Westbrook part of it where you go, at least the guy thinks he's awesome. And then you're like, yeah, but is that to the detriment of the team, which I would argue. But then you've got the Paul George side of the spectrum where you go, does he know that he's awesome? Because, man, like, if you look at his efficiency stuff, and, you know, again, there's none of this stuff is perfect on the stats, but it's a pretty good indicator. Like, if you look at PER, if you're a wing player and you're over 15, you know, that's that's good. If you're really good, you should be at 20. And Paul George, for five of the last six years of his career, despite one of the years in Oklahoma City, I think it was the second year, um, he, was below, he was over 20. So when you're over 20 in PER, it's usually not a mistake, all right? Unless it's Hassan Whiteside. Like we said, with big guys, it's it's a joke, and those numbers get really weird sometimes. But with George, you know, he's had playoff seasons. His PER is 14.6, 18.8, 14.7, 17.9. If you have two under five or under 15, like below 15 is a below average player. And the defensive plus minus on the, some of the box score, if you buy into that, again, I, I like it at the extremes. In the middle, it can get a little muddy. But he, he's just across the board worse on those numbers. So, you know, the Clippers are supposed to have two of those guys. And right now they have one. And Mitchell is, is good enough or at least good enough to equal that. So that's kind of like off the Danny Green thing where we're watching it going, why do they keep running this drag screen left to right and Danny Green just getting torched on it every time? And now you leave Embiid in the middle. So now you're kind of taking him out of the game defensively. Why are you going to let that happen for entire straight first half? I wonder what we'll see with Ty Lue's adjustment with Luke Kennard um, getting caught in those screens. I mean, just a screen, right side, Mitchell brings it over. And then they tried to double him, and he was splitting those. There was another one that was the biggest play, I thought, where Kennard was on him in the switch, and Kawhi's like, all right, screw this, I'm bringing the double. And Mitchell saw it, he, and Kawhi got there late, and then Monty Morris stays, excuse me, um, Marcus Morris, stays glued to Gobert and doesn't bring the help, and it's a layup, and it's over. So, you know, we'll look for that to close the game if the Jazz are Kennard hunting again which I think they would, which is pretty amazing if you think about Canard and the French translation. But a um, little, little culture for you. Um, we'll see. We'll see if Ty leaves him in there. Okay, final thought here on, on Joker winning the MVP. We have a run uh, that is unprecedented. The developmental side of this league with its stars. Uh, the stars have for decades been the guys, okay? <laughs> like, if you look at the best players and you look at the MVPs, whether it's Akeem, whether it's Duncan, it's David Robinson, certainly Jordan, Bird, Magic, um, Shaq. You know, Kobe was a little different situation, but he only had one. LeBron winning a ton of them. You know, most of the people winning the MVPs, you can say the player got better, and the joke about the last dance, and it was awesome, but it also could have been called, you know, a few guys got taller. Uh, the run that we've had between Kawhi in moments winning a finals MVP and looking like the best player on the floor in a Spurs Miami series and then Toronto and Golden State, and he doesn't have the straight MVP, but like, yeah, we, we flirted with the idea where it's not insane to say Kawhi's the best player in the world. Um, he's not right now. I think it's Durant. And I don't even know what to say about the Nets. The fact that they're doing this without Harden is is absolutely horrifying. I mean, are they not even going to need him? <laughs> that seems crazy to me. Although I know what I'm going to do. I'm just keep picking Phoenix every single time. Uh, and maybe you shouldn't listen to me. But Jokic wins, and we had told you this you know, a month or so ago, is he the most unlikely superstar in NBA history? I believe that he is. He's really the only second-round pick, the real first second round pick to win an MVP in the modern era. 
if you look at the highest picks or the number of MVPs per pick, the lowest pick is the way I should actually phrase that is 15, right? 15 is the lowest draft slot that we've seen someone win the MVP. From 16 down to 41 or 16 down to four, it's no one. And then it's Jokic. So between Kawhi, Giannis back-to-back MVPs in that 15 slot, and now Jokic, I don't know what it means. I don't know what it means. I don't know if development has changed. I don't know if that means you're supposed to go ahead and take slow guys now from Serbia. I don't know if that means you're supposed to take six, nine guys that are going to grow to maybe seven feet that are from Greece. And you don't really know what to do with them. I mean, look, Giannis, in the beginning of his NBA career, I wasn't sure. Kawhi was still somewhat limited. I mean, you can even throw Jimmy Butler into the mix from last year, but we've had a a run of the last few years where it is absolutely unprecedented the amount of people that have been developmental success stories to be the best players in this game. And that's not that's just not how this draft has ever worked. And I don't know that it means, you know, I'll say very often, when something happens, it doesn't always mean that it's something. And I'm just not sure what that something is right now. <laughs> 